whenever you're ready. Okay. Okay, so, so Joan, just, just tell me a little bit how long you've been a nurse and where you got your training um, and, so before, and uh, where you were and, 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 with, and therefore then, you know, how many years you were working by 1986. All right, you know, I have to figure out the math on that. All right, well, All right. I graduated in 1953 from Mercy School of Nursing, part of Mercy College of Detroit. Um, and I've done med surge nursing, psych nursing, rehab nursing, um, geriatrics. And then I came into the state in 19... 76, and I worked for them for a couple of years, then left, and then came back. And so I've actually had like 17 and a half years experience with the Ohio Department of Health, Community Public Health Nursing. Mm -hmm. What was one of your other questions? Well, yeah, I, I haven't asked anybody this yet. Okay. Why did you want to become a nurse? And if you could include my question in your answer. Okay, why did I want to become a nurse? Number one, um, do you want, I had this feeling of wanting to help people. I started out working as a nurse aide when I was a senior in high school. And then I went into that full time and obtained a scholarship for nursing. And that was number one, plus in my day, there weren't too many scholarships available for females except nursing and teaching. And, you know, so but that had some impact on it. But um, I found as a nurse aide, I really found, I found my niche. And then I enjoyed it very much, so. And what yeah. was it? What was about it that was your niche? Was it an emotional thing with the patients? What was it? Oh, it was just, I felt very comfortable doing it. I felt compassion for people, and I felt good helping people. And so tell me about working um, in the Ohio State facility, and what was there always a union there? Did you need one? What was that like? No, in 1984, uh, the bill was passed by the Ohio legislature to allow collective bargaining. And from that point on, uh, that meant we had a choice of what type of union or what union we wanted. So uh, all of the unions came to talk with us, so we interviewed the other unions. Instead of them interviewing us, we interviewed them. And uh, we talked with AXME, communication workers. Um, we called ONA, but they wanted their money up front before they'd even come and talk to us, so we scratched them off the list completely. And that's the Ohio Nurse Association. And then we talked with 1199, and we were very impressed with 1199, because in 1199 we had the voice, and we would have some say in what goes on. And another thing, they didn't make promises to us. They said, it's up to you, it's your union, what you get is what you get. And that impressed us quite a bit, so. Could you describe to me what your work life, okay, we're gonna wait till that goes by, but what your work life was like before this collective bargaining measure went in, and did you really need it? I mean, what even precipitated Oh yes, we were, we were always working under a crisis. It was either a Medicare crisis or a Medicaid crisis coming in, and we would put 50, 60 hours a week in just to get the work done. We never got overtime, didn't even know we were entitled to it. There was a tremendous amount of favoritism shown, and we would try as a group to uh, file a grievance because in one unit, another department, the nurses received a dollar an hour more, and yet the jobs were almost similar, almost exactly alike. And yet, uh, because we didn't have the title RN in our uh, title, they said they wouldn't give us that other dollar. 
And so that, there was that. And there, as I say, a lot of favoritism shown. Um, the supervisors, if they liked someone, they gave them the nicer facilities to survey. If they d didn't particularly care for you, they sent you into some of the worst facilities. Uh, now, not all supervisors were like that, but some, enough to make a difference. Plus the... Um, if you were liked by the director of health, that was fine. And if you weren't, that was another problem then. And there was a lot of favoritism. And that's and we didn't even know the other departments in the uh, state. We never had contact with them. Uh, we were never we never had any in service programs, no educational programs, no communications. And there are so many other departments in the state of Ohio, you know. And it wasn't until after the union came in and then we met with the cross agencies and the executive board and we found out that there were other d uh, divisions of the state out there. So, so so your work life was really very tense, and then there's a lot of equity issues, and then this, um, and then this new law came in. Did you were you pressing for this law? I mean, I don't understand. There was some pressing. I myself was not. I was unaware at that point of it. Like I said, we were treated like mushrooms, you know, kept in the dark, and I won't complete the rest of it. So. Okay. Al knows what I'm talking about. So, so you had no, I mean, just imagine there's people, a lot of us don't know all this history, so you just have to help us a little. So prior to this law getting enacted, you had absolutely no right to collect bargaining whatsoever. Correct. Correct. Okay. Repeat this sentence if it's true. Okay. So before... We got the had the right to collect bargaining. We were treated like mushrooms, kept in the dark, and given manure. I mean, if that's true, say that whole thing and explain to us that you had absolutely no rights. If that's the case, because before this law, is that? That's right. <laughs> All right. It, um, before collective bargaining, we were treated just like mushrooms. You know, we were kept in the dark and fed manure. And we had no rights. Once we tried to file a grievance and it went absolutely nowhere under civil service, and the supervisor said, well, according to procedure, we don't have to respond. And so they don't. And we never were able to get a grievance through. And I was uh, talking earlier about a unit that got a dollar an hour more than us just because they had the uh, title RN. And we did that. We were called facility surveyors, but no lines. So therefore, they paid a dollar more, even though we substantially did the same work. So, um, so then, so then the state, so then you get the right to collect a bargaining, and now you have an opportunity to choose. Not only you don't only have the right to collect bargaining, but you have the right to choose which union you want to work with. So we work, so you weren't organized at all prior to this, or you were? Correct. Correct. Okay, so mm -hmm. you have to repeat, to some extent, what I just said in your own words, okay. so that you can help bring us up to date, because I guess it was a big, it was a big deal to have you all become a part of this. Okay, so prior to the collective bargaining. Right. Prior to collective bargaining. Um, well, no. no well, I'm prior sorry. to this law, right? No, okay. Am, am I right? Right. Okay, you know this better than I do, so. So if you could just help us. So prior to, the, prior to this law. Right. Go ahead. being enacted for collective bargaining. Prior to 1984, I worked as a registered nurse with the Ohio Department of Health, and we had absolutely no rights. There was so much favoritism shown. Um, we couldn't even, we did not even have a grievance procedure that we could utilize. All right, then 1984 legislature passed a collective bargaining bill, which meant that we had the right to unionize. And from then, we just interviewed the various unions, like AXME, uh, communication workers, ONA, and 1199. 
and we decided, elected 1199, based on the fact that it uh, was a union that was more democratic and gave us a voice in uh, determining our own working conditions and giving us a voice in uh, our wages and so forth. Was that, what was that like, a group of nurses sitting around and having all that power to say, oh, I think I'll try that union instead of that union? Well, it was a little different. We questioned and interviewed all of them. Uh, in my office where I worked, we had a nurse who was a former nursing home administrator. I'm a former director of nursing who um, was on the other side of the negotiating table back in the 70s. And so many of us had questions about unions. And um, so we asked. And the fact was that 1199 was so very truthful in their responses to us. And they didn't try to pull the wool over our eyes or anything. And they told us that well, what we get in our contract is up to you. That's you for you to determine, not for us. And whereas the others were trying to give you all sorts of promises and so forth. So uh, that's why we decided when the election came, uh, we voted. And we contacted all the different district offices at that time and compared notes. And we found the same thing all over, you know. So everyone wanted 1199. So, so, okay, then and then on, we were able to. Okay, you know, we have a car yeah. coming. While, while this car is going by, I'm just wondering, do you recall like all sitting around looking at each other and saying? How we didn't going? realize at the time the power. It wasn't until we became involved with the union that you realize the power. Okay, I guess maybe not the power, but I'm just saying like, was there um, this like moment, can I stop the camera for a second? Was there like- No, not really. Okay. Mm -mm. No. Okay. Uh -uh. Now, was it true that, um, so when you, so, so now it's 1980, so by, this is 84, is it, it's 86 when you guys actually joined? That's when we had our district? first contract, when our first contract was signed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. The process they had to go through was to divide up throughout the whole state which were the professional group and which were non-professional. Okay. And so that between the professionals would belong to 1199 and non-professionals would belong to another union. Okay. All right. So that was being set up by the uh, so, serve board at the okay. time. Okay. So. Oh, can you stop for a second? <clears throat> okay. So, so now, how many people do you bring to 11.99 and 9? How many? Pe all of a sudden, how many people are you bringing from? Is the whole state uh, we had approximately, I believe, 3,000 state employees okay. at that time. Okay. And so, you're not, I, I was talking over you. So, if you could say so, now once we choose 11.99. We have X number of employees that we bring to the district. Oh, okay. So when we chose 1199 uh, through the elections, this brought about 3,000 new members to 1199, which doubled the size of 1199. So that brought us up to about 6,000 members. And yet it was still constructed that people still had a voice and made the determination of what was going on with that union. So how did y'all get integrated into the union? Well, as I said, we, were, we elected our delegates and we elected our negotiators. And then we elected people to the executive board. And the communication, with the executive board would meet about every three months. And the executive board people would come back and form the delegates. The delegates would inform the members through their uh, meetings. And, you know, we would have meetings at least once a month, quite often twice a month. And so that's how we were able to know what was going on, also how we could voice our opinion. And if uh, 
the delegates and the board members would come back with questions and how do we feel about certain things, and so people would respond. Then they also have, uh, they had delegate training for the delegates that uh, instructed them. Our delegates would come back and mention to us how great it was, much better than anything the state ever put on for educational programs. Did you meet people from other states? I mean, did you meet different kinds of workers and different kinds of people in the other states that you would never have met before? Uh, yes, we did. And when they started going to the various convention, our delegates did. And I myself, as a delegate, I replaced someone, uh, a delegate, who was, had to leave for another position. And so I was involved at that time in the negotiations and establishing our career ladder. And then I, when in negotiations, we met other people of the state. And I guess what I mean ahead. by that is like, you're a professionals, right? So what does it mean? You're professionals yet, now you're gonna be meeting your professionals joining a union that doesn't just represent professionals, right? Right. In other words, I you mean, you're, you're nurses that are joining a union that also represents technicians and people that are not necessarily nurses. Did that right. In other words, all the various delegates. Right, that's who you met. Uh, you met the, from the different departments, from the state hospitals, you did meet physicians, dentists, dietitians, other registered nurses who worked in mental health facilities or MR facilities, uh, prisons, the nurses who work in the prisons, and the psychologists, the um, psych assistants, all professional people. And that's when we kind of found out that there were other professional people people involved in the state. We never had contact with them previously, and we found many of the problems were the same throughout. And that uh, then when we got together, that is when we began to realize how much power we had, because uh, we were able to make decisions and sit down with the state on an equal basis and say, no, that is not correct, that is not right, this is how it will be done, et cetera, and so forth. And, you know, through the process of negotiation. Did you join for the money? Well, that was part of it, I have to admit. We were two-thirds below what the private sector was getting paid at the time, and yet we were supposed to be, quote, the experts, and we would go in to survey them and tell them what they were doing incorrectly, you know. So, and yet they all made much more money than we did. And so uh, that entered into it. And, mm -hmm. Okay, because I guess I was under the impression that in, on, in, on some level, you all actually, you were, you were not sort of people that sort of came from union backgrounds necessarily, and that um, as... Correct, right. Well, nurses especially have that background of, quote, they're professional, and you're taught to deal with your own problems. Well, after a while, you begin to realize that that's just way they have of keeping you under, keeping you down. And, you know, they can control you that way, and you have no voice, and say, in your working conditions or your job or your patient care. And that was a big problem there, and because if you were short on staffing and so forth, and you couldn't do the uh, work that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And so that was a big uh, difference. We were able to improve the staffing levels throughout. I know our department increased from 50 when uh, in 1986 to over 300 within six years. Okay. I guess um, I, I've been under. It's been. I've, it's been said a couple of times, and I guess that's what, the reason I asked you was. Well, you're a professional nurse. Mm -hmm. You don't need a union. Most of all, you don't need to be in the same kind of union that might have food workers or janitorial workers in it. I basically, some people did think that they did not want to 
be in a union uh, with non-professional people. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, but when we talked with them, we found problems were the same, and people are people, and their problems are the same. And any problems that are unique to our department or division, we resolve, and we do our own contract. So. And was that, was that an issue for it? Is, is that statement really true? Uh, there was a car going through it before that, mm -hmm. that nurses, professional nurses don't need a union. And if it's, that's true, I mean, if About, that's a statement, repeat my statement for I, me. Uh, at one time, all nurses were taught, I call it brainwashed or conditioned, that you as a professional do not need a union and that you can handle your own problems individually. But you find out after, as you have experience, you find that does not work and that you get absolutely nowhere. And so you realize eventually what had happened that you had been conditioned for that. Were you taught that you were not part of the working class or you were part of the working class? You don't. Um, in some ways you were part of the working class, but in other ways you were a little bit above. It was like you bettered yourself. That was the term that they used to say. You bettered yourself. And now you wear t-shirts that say what? Oh, I wear t-shirts now that saying, I'm kicking ass for the working class. Yeah. <laughs> and we do because nurses all over, uh, they work as hard as everybody else. We're all working class. The only ones who aren't are the CEOs throughout all the corporations. Now, um, so so then, so that you join. Now, what does you just you just brought? Did you say three thousand members? At that time, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna wait for this car to get by. Can you say that? Because that is a big deal. All right, I, I I'll repeat it. I thought I had. Before. You did say it. I'm just okay. asking you to like come in by saying we brought in three thousand members. What did that do for the region? Okay, All right, we brought in three thousand members when we joined the union, which doubled the union and its resources so which also then enabled the union to enlarge even more also at that time we were able to enlarge some of the professionals coming into the union and our division itself we hired uh, from went from 50 surveyors up to 300 throughout the whole state of Ohio and that brought a big impact, and the same in human services and in other divisions. And what does it mean when a nurse fights for the rights of a janitor? Well, you fight for the right of a person. You're not. I know. So repeat after mm -hmm. me. I know, but but some people don't think like that, Joan. You know that. Yes, I know some people think that you don't fight for janitors, but most nurses and people I know of know, uh, people are people. You fight for the rights for everyone. So it's not whether you're a janitor or registered nurse or an LPN or a dietitian. Uh, you fight for everybody. Everyone is entitled to their rights. This is a democratic country. so. But you know, I mean, is that something that you, that, that people are learning through the union process that they might not learn in the, in the big world? Um, looking back over 12 years, I think people have learned that they've had contact with different people that they themselves have grown and matured emotionally as well as it was a big learning process for everybody and it's been a tremendous growth for all of us. Can you, can you point to one moment for you where you were in a position that you never could have imagined being in or you were in a room with people you could have never imagined being with and something magic happened? Oh, the first time I was on the executive board, 
I was trembling and scared to death. And you went in, you didn't really know anybody there except maybe your state coordinator. And it was very frightening. And you see all these different people. And then all of a sudden, people start coming out and talking to you. And then when the meeting started, everyone gave a report of what's going on in their facilities. And you were just welcomed in and like another person and another member. I mean, it just, just solidarity. You were a brother or sister. Did you, had you ever experienced that kind of solidarity before? Never. Never. Not really. Mm -mm. And uh, never experienced that in my lifestyle before of acquiring a large group of people as brothers and sisters. Would you have believed that you, John Earls, could, could strike the state of Ohio? Well, at one time I thought I would never be able to strike in the state of Ohio. And until you ran into situations and you realized that they were not bargaining in good faith and that uh, people and patients were suffering because of it. Therefore, we did decide to go on a one-day strike, and it was effective. When we got uh, it during the, our last negotiations, and then we did... Um, we were the first in the state of Ohio to turn down a fact finder's report, which had never ever happened in the history of the union before. And then they didn't want to accept that. So then we did threaten with the one day strike, and we did. We went on strike, and it was effective. Okay, we're gonna stop for a plane. Get up on, and I have to swallow. No. And we have speed. Did you, Joan Earls, ever think that you could strike the state of Ohio? When we first joined the union, I never thought I would ever be in a strike. You know, I said that was something a professional doesn't do. All right. So this last negotiation contract in 1997. We started in January of 97, and we went through May of 97, and we were getting absolutely nowhere, and the word had come down from the governor that uh, we had too good a contract because we had a better contract than any of the other unions did in the state of Ohio, and so therefore they were to take it away. So it was an actual battle and a fight. And we went, as poor rules, to the fact finder. And we were the first to ever turn down a fact finder's report in the state of Ohio. And actually, it threw the state. They really didn't know what to do, what the procedure was or what. And for a while, they even refused to come back to the table. Then eventually, they knew they had to. And we, the people voted to turn down that fact finder's report. I believe it was by 88%, and I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe those were the figures. They turned down that fact finder's report. So then we went back and uh, tried negotiations. This time, the, quote, union buster that the governor had, and which he had paid $350,000 to for negotiations, refused to let him make any decisions. They had to go back to the governor. And it was not a matter of money. And they told us they had the money. That wasn't the point. And it's just that they wanted to do it, and they were going to do it. And, of course, as public employees, we work uh, through the the legislature, you know, and one strike of the pen and collective bargaining can be out the door. And so we do depend on the legislature and the governor, you know, for, to, for our negotiations. So um, then they gave us an offer which still did not satisfy us, so we decided to take a strike vote for a one-day strike vote. We did not go any further because of um, 
the single women uh, with children. That, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. So I want you to start from the point of. So they said. The last thing they said was this, and we decided to just take a strike vote. And just describe to me their room. Like, I don't mean like the, the board, I don't mean like, you know, what kind of ceiling it looked like, but like, who was in the room, and a group of you deciding that we were going to take a strike vote, and then tell me the rest of that story. Just, I, just because that's a, it's always a critical moment. All right. All right. Well, they came back with an offer, which we refused and then we decided to caucus and so all the negotiators which were about 20 people then got together and said no so then we said maybe we need to go back uh, to the members and see if they want to take a strike vote they had been informed of the possibility earlier and so uh, the members elected then to take a strike vote and so we gave the legal notice that we must give according to law for public employees. So they received their 10-day notice that we would be striking. And uh, that was in August 5th of 1997. So you took, you, you're starting to say that, so you took a strike vote and you only decided to do it for one day because, right. and it's like, is it a group right. of nurses sitting in there that say, all right, Joan, let's strike. And what's going on there? Now, uh, the negotiating committee, which had nurses, psychologists, uh, dentists, um, I don't think there were any dietitians, but all various professional people of the state were in that room. And we decided to go back with the members. And But because we had so many single parents in our union, 65% of our union are female, and many of them are single parents, and it's difficult for them to go on strike, plus the fact that so many of our members care about their patients. Yeah, that was another thing that bothered them. They became they become very possessive. They call them my patients. You know? And so they were worried, and they knew the supervisors were not very competent and that they were fearful that someone would get harmed with the supervisors taking care of them. So we decided to go for a one-day strike only. And we did that on August 5th, 1997. And how did that feel? Were you out in mass? Were there thousands? Of oh people? yes, we. Oh, it was great feeling. It was a great feeling, believe it or not. And here I thought I would never strike, and yet I found I was glad we were doing it and felt very good about it. We had a rally. Some of the places throughout the whole state, we had picket lines out there uh, before seven o'clock in the morning, and they were manned throughout for 24 hours. And I was myself down at the rally uh, that we held in Columbus and as vice president of the uh, state association I was needed down there for the rally so I was there when we finished the rally I went out to uh, Lorraine County and uh, the jail out there and got on the picket line out there with them and I uh, was on there till about seven or eight at night went home grabbed pizza and two of my granddaughters and my husband went back up and out on the picket line with them again and gave them you know, something to eat and that type of thing. So it was uh, the camaraderie, the solidarity, it was tremendous, you know. People felt good and they had people watching us, taking pictures with cameras, you know, and people were waving at them and we had picket signs saying grandma on strike and so forth, so it was good very good and it was effective um, many of the prisons uh, had some riots you know they were uh, upset and they took advantage of it and so this was very effective to, to the state of Ohio so they wanted to come back so then they came back with the final offer were the prisoners um, rioting on your behalf well Yes, there, there was something for them to do. Some of the prisoners um, 
said they were having chest pain. And of course, according to the law, if they're complaining and need medical services, they have to be examined. Well, they couldn't because there were no physicians or nurses on duty. And so then they said they were going to sue the state of Ohio because they were not receiving medical treatment. And they did it because, on behalf of the workers there. Mm -hmm. Were you all wearing your whites when you were out there? Oh, no. Some of us don't know. No. We uh, wore our 1199 t-shirts and everything. Mm -hmm. Talking about strikes, did you, um, and did you ever imagine you yourself just like, you, you, you look like a, you know, a very nice, proper lady. Right. <laughs> but what is right is right. And uh, if this is the last resort, this is what you would do in order for other people to have their rights. Mm -hmm. Even a proper lady? Even a proper lady. <laughs> it, uh, what is proper? I mean, you know, uh, I don't know exactly what you're asking at I'm this just, point. Well, anyway, yeah. we'll go on to something okay. else. I was just saying, you know, I mean, a lot of people, it's like grandma on strike. Grandma strike? <laughs> right, grandma on strike. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandchildren thought it was great, and they saw the power of what people can do when they stand together. And that was a very important lesson for them to learn, as well as others to learn. Why did you bring your grandchildren with you on that on that picket line, and where were you with them? All right, we were at the Lorraine County uh, jails, and we took uh, the uh, prison, the state prison there, and we I took my grandchildren, two of them. They were in their teens. One was 17, the other was 15 at the time. And I took them to show, you know, what unions can do, what solidarity means, standing together with other people. And one of them had gone to a couple union meetings with me when I was doing some volunteer organizing. And she saw, you know, what went on at the meetings, and she was a little interested. So we took them with us. Mm -hmm. Do you think she thinks about you differently? I mean, is that a different am image of grandma? No, no, they always knew grandma was different. They did. <laughs> so um, they never had the image of me as the gray-haired lady sitting home knitting or something. Yeah. So they always knew I was out there working and um, being up front. Did you go to the Orthodox Jewish strike? Were you there in solidarity? No, I did. yes I did. I was working at the time and I was assigned to work in that area. So I went by at one time and I took some chicken, box of chicken for the members there. And just as I got there, they had a tornado warning and poured down rain and everybody scattered for, into their cars. So that was about it. But I talked with a lot of the members, you know, at the e-boards on that. Now, I understand you're telling me you are in the midst of an organizing campaign right now as we speak. Yes, I'm on uh, a leave from my job, and I'm what's known as a member organizer, in which I had taken the internship program about three years ago, I think. And so we are organizing a hospital, and we have over 70% card signed for the registered nurses, and the LPN is in text, two different chapters. And so we are having our election May 1st, just five days from now. And so far, we still have a good majority. And by the time this video is shown, I hope that we will have our members there at the delegate assembly. Mm -hmm. Now, so. Okay. Thank you. I just. It's fun just to talk. I enjoy talking about the union. Oh, you're very inspiring. 
just for the, re- for the historical record. <laughs> okay, so if you don't mind telling me how old you are, how long you've been doing this, and you're an organizer now? Right. Oh, my. This is personal question, right? I am 65. I'll be 66 in a couple of months. And I am on... Uh, I've been off almost three months now organizing a group of uh, Barnesville Employees United in Barnesville, Ohio. And I'll be out for another month. And uh, I thoroughly enjoy it. It is fun. And those women out there and those men are just terrific. I'll tell you, they have the strongest committee, the strongest organization I have seen. And it is so such an honor to work with them. And you know, some people retire when they're 65. Well, I probably would have retired at 65 if I hadn't been part of the union and, you know, feel a certain commitment to it. And I debated about that when I ran for second term as vice president. And yet at sometimes I still needed to work for a little while yet. So I decided, no, I'm going to run for vice president and I'll just work until that term is finished and then I'll retire. Then I'll probably organize part of a retirement we'll get into the associate members program and we'll get retired people in there <laughs> so describe to me is it disarming for these for these for these folks in Barnesville to have a 65 year old grandma come no I don't think so because uh, in Barnesville they have a lot of uh, older nurses that are similar to my age or close to it And this is the thing that's upsetting to them with managed care, that they eliminate the older experienced nurse and you have the younger nurses coming in and therefore the younger nurses do not have the mentors. And this is how you learn through experience and from mentors. And they find that they're being tried to uh, be eliminated. And so how are nurses going to learn about good patient care and what you need to do to achieve that if they eliminate the older staff and that's they're very upset over that so they have no qualms with me being older we get along great you know they're a good group of people I, I didn't mean qualms I guess you know the typical organizer that we all know about is sort of like the young person right right the typical organizer is young <coughs> Can you start again? Uh, the typical organizer is a young person, and here I am at my age, and yet I have no problems. I work my 12, 16 hours a day. Sometimes I beat them you know, because I, you learn how to pace yourself as you get older. And it, they're good. They're very good organizers. And, but it, you're an organizer. It doesn't matter on your age. You know, an organizer is an organizer. And but you're able to organize because of your background, because of exactly, because you're effective because of everything you are exactly right now, right? Correct, because of... So you got oh, I'm sorry. Build my question right. into your answer. All right. Uh, because of my experience of a nurse and as an organizer, as a member organizer, um, you can do this, and it's... It's very good, and you have no problems with the younger organizers. Mm-hmm. Are you subversive this way? Am I what? Subversive. Is this a sort of subversive move? I don't know. All right, forget that. Yeah, forget that. Forget I'm... that. It doesn't work. Okay, so what kind of activities are you doing? And build us up to Friday and this march that this wacky doctor on a holy... Oh. All right, with the Barnesville employees, we had a rally last week, which I understand you usually don't have in an organizing campaign, but we decided to do it anyhow because that committee was so strong, and it was tremendous. It was a very big success. And from that rally, we had other union leaders there, too, as well as our own president, and we sang songs. We um, 
had Robert Birch, a politician, a former labor relations person there, he talked, and we had some of the other union leaders speak, and the people thought it was terrific. Now, we on Wednesday, we're having a prayer and candlelight vigil, and we have four local ministers that are participating, so we have the community behind us. Our community outreach was very effective. And so we will be having a prayer meeting and a candlelight vigil. Again, that's something you usually have either one or the other. We're combining it and having both. And so people are very excited about that and because they know this is a very serious step and they want all the help and support they can get. Amen. Then, Amen. then comes Wait, Friday. I just need one sentence and I'm going to ask what it is and... and what do you mean what the, what the campaign is, what Wednesday was? The first, the first sentence is all I need. Okay. I didn't hear that. With um, you, of course you didn't hear it. Mm -hmm. She's whispering to me. So, oh. um, can you give me just the first, first sentence? The, the first sentence of what? Just tell me. Tell me what you want her to say. Just she, she described that this was, there was this rally. I don't know what this rally was. I just need the oh. first sentence. Oh, okay. So it last was, was it last Wednesday? You mean like the last Tuesday? Last Tuesday. Last Tuesday. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could you repeat that? Say last Tuesday we had a rally for the Barnesville workers in. Okay. You know, just to explain. Uh, that, that rally, and if that was like, if, if that was a huge deal, did the press come? Or did you take the town by storm? Last Before Tuesday. we go on, yeah. the press was there, and we got uh, a very bad picture. Should I tell about that, Al? It's okay. Okay. It's our tape, John. Don't worry. Yeah. About Are you aware of what happened? Uh -huh. They took a picture of the one worker and her daughter, and they were clamping, you know, and the one looks like she was praying. Well, see, the administration had been calling us a cult anyhow, calling our union a cult. And then after we had the rally, in uh, last Tuesday, and people were there singing and clapping and chanting and so forth. It was a fun thing. And we had union leaders there and politicians and so forth, and everyone had a tremendous time. Well, the next day in the paper, the uh, Times leader put out a picture under local headlines, and they had a picture of one of the workers and her a daughter standing there clapping and the one looked like she was praying. So underneath they put on their uh, Paula Triplett and daughter Jody uh, listening to the ramblings of the union henchmen. Later they both went up and sold their, soul, their souls to the union devil. This became, oh, that was horrible. And well, the party involved who had the picture taken uh, is taking a, taking them to court is suing. And uh, plus everybody got on. We all called the editor and so forth. He tried to explain that it was a lark. And I said, a lark? Since when? And I said, where were you? What was your job? You're supposed to be editing. What happened to you? You know, I said, this is ridiculous. You're going to be hearing from unions from out the whole valley. Well, and this is exactly what happened. All the different unions got there, and I was talking with one of the gas station attendants the other day, and he told me that um, there was 350 subscriptions canceled because of that. They did fire the person who wrote that. And then um, there also, we got our apologies on the front page of that newspaper the next day. But even the Bill Berger from the AFL-CIO is involved in it now. So, and that just agitated people to no end. And we had people wanting to join that. Uh, the paraprofessionals that hadn't signed cars are now people are willing to sign. Excellent. Thank you. Can you just talk to me? Don't I know that you're looking at Al.